Project Wingman is the latest in the venerable Ace Combat. Wait, what? This is something else. Huh. Project Wingman is a flight action game from Sector D2. Part of what makes this impressive is that Sector D2 is three guys. They might have inked a publishing deal with Humble Games, but this is otherwise about as indie as you get. The game is set on an Earth transformed by ecological disaster. Much of Western North America is gone, Hawaii isn't looking so hot, and Florida is mostly unchanged because not even an act of God can kill that hell state. Humanity survived the calamity, and after returning to a near future tech level, decided it'd be sick to have some wars. You play Monarch, a freelance pilot flying for mercenary group Sicario. You're in the right place at the right time to hear about a war brewing. The nation of Cascadia is at odds with the Pacific Federation, who want to claim the region for its abundant resources. In response, Cascadia hires mercenaries, including Sicario, to bring their war effort back from the brink. This might sound strikingly familiar to some of you, so let's just get something out of the way. Yes, this game is inspired by Ace Combat, particularly Ace Combat Zero. Some people are hung up on that really hung up on that. So here's the deal. We'll acknowledge that, yes, this game is inspired by that game, and after that, I'm gonna cover this game on its own merits. I'm not gonna pretend Ace Combat doesn't exist, but instead of chaining the two games together and draining the phrase like Ace Combat of all meaning, I'll try to only compare the two when absolutely necessary. So, way back in 2015, Abi R.B. Romani was working on what would become Project Wingman. The earliest images are from November 2015, when it was slim pickings for modern flight action. Ubisoft had made two Hawks games before abandoning the genre forever, and Ace Combat seemed intent to do its thing on PlayStation. Then in December, this happened. This actually wasn't that big of a deal for R.B. His game was being made for PC, and the reveal trailer implied A7 would be a PS4 exclusive. Then in January 2017, this happened. Yeah, I think this is a fairly appropriate reaction given the circumstances. Despite that, RB persevered, and after a successful Kickstarter and that humble deal, Project Wingman launched on December 1st, 2020. That's a little off the mark from their original May 2019 target, but Ace Combat 7 missed its original release date by two years, so they're in good company. Let's talk presentation. If you forced me to describe the visuals of Project Wingman with a single overused turn of phrase, I'd say they're more than the sum of their parts. Planes are the stars of the show and look good, but terrain can be a little rough around the edges. The thing is, while parts of the scene might not look great, the scenes as a whole can be gorgeous. There's a great variety in the environments, with levels set above islands, in the desert, and amidst wine country. Each biome is distinct, and the visuals are pulled together by some great lighting. The lighting carries some levels, and I was impressed how it was tied to environmental conditions. If you're flying through a thunderstorm, you'll be under dark clouds, but if you break through, there's clear skies. It adds visual variety and keeps things fresh when a dogfight takes you through the clouds. If the lighting has flaws, it's that they really, really like the color orange. In Project Wingman's Earth, the circumpacific ring of fire is more active and volatile than in our own. How do you visualize a world dominated by volcanic and geothermal activity? Make everything orange. There are orange skies, orange lakes of fire, and orange exhausts from the game's airships. There are even maps that are orange as a spoiler, believe it or not. I don't think there's any badly lit level in the campaign, but absence makes the heart grow fonder, and I was definitely missing clear blue skies by the end. That was going to be all I had to say about lighting, but while I was working on this, RB adjusted lighting in four levels with plans to do more. There are improvements across the board, so I expect it'll only get better over time. Overall, the game's environments are easy on the eyes, and a treat to fight through. Jets look good in motion, and while the cockpits might not be as detailed as, uh, Star Wars Squadrons, they're great for immersing yourself in the flight experience. I assume that they look rad as hell in VR, which the game officially supports, but since I don't own these, I can't have an informed opinion on what Flight Sim Turbo Nerd mode is like. I can say that the visual feedback of combat is great. You can judge the size of a battle by the number of missile trails in the air, and gunfire leaves streams of tracers in the sky. Planes and airships don't just explode, you can watch their burning wrecks fall towards Earth. There's really only one complaint that I feel strongly about towards the visuals, but unfortunately it's the big one. This game has some major performance issues in large-scale combat. This is what happened when I tried to engineer the largest battle I could think of. So performance has some issues, but I'm hopeful they'll be patched. There are also no Anime Girl skins, so I'm counting on the mod community to come through. 
I'd be remiss if I didn't mention sound, which is generally quite good. Guns and explosions sound satisfying, and you can hear the sonic booms from your jet as well as others that you pass head on. I didn't know that was a thing before playing this, and it speaks to the attention to detail on display. Voice work is good to okay and has the widest quality range of the soundscape. There are a few rough takes, and subtitles don't always match dialogue. As I understand, some voice actors were volunteers, so I can grade this on a curve. I'm well aware how hard it can be to get good audio, and I have huge respect for them voicing the game out of sheer passion. I liked the main cast, and despite the occasional awkward bit of dialogue, it was good voice work that endeared me to them. My favorite is Prez, your buddy who rides with you in two-seat planes. Looks like it's just me and you. No big deal, right? Hey, what about me? Talk to me when you start piloting, Prez. Don't tell me you're not riding coattails. Piss off, you yuppie. I've only known Prez for a couple weeks now, but I'd do anything for her. Prez is up there, but she isn't even the best part of the audio. It's the music. I wasn't familiar with composer Jose Pavli's work, so I had no expectations going in. Through the first couple of missions, I thought, hey, this music is pretty good. By the halfway mark, I was hooked, and the first thing I did after finishing the game was buy the soundtrack. It's fantastic, and it evokes mood phenomenally well, especially in the boss themes. Overall, presentation is pretty good, and graded on a curve for the size and resources of the team, it's a great looking game. I should probably talk about the gameplay now, huh? Combat in Project Wingman is a straightforward affair. You're a matchmaker, and it's your job to connect tanks, ships, and aircraft with hot single explosives in their area. The flight model is pretty arcadey, so the gamepad controls are intuitive and will come naturally if you've played similar titles. I've warmed up to KBM flying after some time in space, but I'd still recommend a gamepad here. There's a mouse aim feature that I really appreciated, but I found it made my plane weirdly wobbly. I'm glad it's there, but it takes some getting used to, and I don't recommend combining it with cockpit view. Most of your kills will come from tailing enemies or approaching head-on while waiting for a lock, then sending them an explosion with free same-day shipping. You've got lots of options for that, with 21 aircraft and a variety of weapons. All craft have a gun and standard missiles, plus 1-3 to three hard points for special weapons. This is something I think Project Wingman actually does better than, uh, Crimson Skies, High Road to Revenge. Instead of choosing one of three special weapons, you can bring a varied arsenal. If you're expecting lots of ground targets as well as aerial threats, you can load air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles to deal with both. Alternatively, you can assert dominance by loading up a frog foot with nothing but machine guns. More of the same weapon means more ammo and being able to fire more at once. This allows different craft to excel in different roles without overly limiting weapon selection. Plus, it keeps you from being completely boned if you, say, bring a bomber to a mission with an aerial boss fight. The weapons themselves are sorted into anti-air, anti-ground, and multi-purpose, which is a humble way of saying anti-everything. Standard missiles are the bread and butter, with the highest ammo capacity and decent homing. The firing angle for a hit is tight, but they're very consistent once you get it down. Guns are much more effective than I expected, with seemingly no spread and gun types that are distinct and fun to use. The slowest firing cannon fires explosive shells, and the other end of the spectrum is high-speed full auto. On post-game planes, this is upgraded to fuller auto. Dedicated anti-air weapons have the smallest pool with only two options. Multi-lock anti-air missiles, or MLAAs, are the most common. These differ considerably from APAA missiles and missiles that follow the Chicago Manual of Style. MLAAs have high damage and are fire and forget from long range, but have poor homing. They don't always work, but when they do, they work great. SAAs are the opposite, with extremely high homing, but only if you keep the target in your sights. They're effective, it's just, well... Monarch ready to fire. Anti-ground weapons include bombs and missiles. Missiles offer higher precision in exchange for less splash damage. They have the accuracy of a robot playing darts, unlike bombs, which have the accuracy of me playing darts. I feel like I've said this before somewhere, but bombs come in varieties of small explosion, big explosion, and really big explosion. That last one is a little different this time around. Now, 
now we are all sons of bitches. There are also unguided missiles, which require better aim in exchange for higher damage. These are technically intended for air-to-ground strikes, but I'm sure some sky god takes great joy in shooting down fighters with them. I don't have that kind of aim, but I do see the appeal. Using the unguided burst pod like an explosive shotgun might be my favorite way to smack down bad men. Multi-purpose weapons are mostly gun pods, which are just more DACA, but it's also where the future tech weapons live. Both post-game planes get rail guns, and one gets a burst missile launcher that is frighteningly effective. No matter how you blow stuff up, you're in for a good time. Lock-ons are fast and weapons reload independently, so it's easy to fall into a rhythm of cycling weapons to deal damage to targets above and below. For some reason, the stuff you shoot shoots back, so it's important to have defensive options. Flares are unlimited use on a short cooldown for when you can't outfly a missile. You're gonna need them. There's also the AOA limiter. I'm not totally sure what this does. Let's give it a try. This thing is so cool. The AOA module allows for ultra-sharp maneuvers and aerial drifting. You can flip and twist around, slide in on a bad man's tail, or take an angled shot without changing course. You lose speed rapidly and it's easy to stall out if you don't know what you're doing, but it adds a crazy amount of mobility and is just a ton of fun to use. I might have made it sound like the AOA module is just better than flares, but they're both strong defensive options and well balanced against each other. Now that we've covered how to blow stuff up, we should cover why to blow stuff up, so it's off to the campaign. Project Wingman's campaign tells the story of Hitman Team's Cascadian vacation across 21 missions. The game opens with a tutorial mission to reclaim a hijacked freighter from pirates off the coast of... Ugh, Florida. You learn the ropes by using jet fighters to blow up dudes in speedboats and seaplanes. This might seem a little unfair, but you're mercenaries. Good sportsmanship doesn't pay the bills. One wave of reinforcements later, your employer orders you to scuttle the freighter. So, you do. That probably won't come up again later. A tip sends you west to Cascadia, where the local rebels want your help and the Federation wants you gone. What follows is a tale of love blooming on the battlefield. A tale of bonds forged and broken as the strength of brotherhood is tested, and yeah, I'm just kidding, it's a war story. I won't get into the details yet, but outside a couple twists, the plot is fairly straightforward. It's uncomplicated, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. War stories are great for telling character stories. When your goal is blow up all the bad men, there's room to focus on gameplay and developing the cast. I liked Hitman Team, and I found them to be well-defined as people. Your AWACS operator Galaxy sometimes sounds performative, like he's a radio host or something. Oh, that's what he was before Sicario. Diplomats' easy upbringing and comics' rough past inform their personalities, and I believe that the team care about each other. When the game tested whether or not I cared about them, I'd say, yeah, I did. I appreciated learning about the team through gameplay, but the execution was hit and miss. In the first half, there are two levels where you get only Comic or Dip as a buddy and not both. I thought this was a cool way to develop them, since maybe they'd be more talkative by themselves, and it would have been, except it doesn't happen. They don't really open up, and most of the dialogue in these missions is focused on the task at hand. I felt like the solo op afterwards shows more of Hitman's relationships than either of the buddy missions. Prez has the same issue. She's likable and easily best girl, but doesn't get a lot of time to shine since she's technically an optional character. By now, you may have noticed a correlation between how many missions a character is in and how fleshed out they are. Hang on to that while we cover mission structure. Levels are, like the plot, fairly straightforward. Most missions follow a formula of downing all marked bad men, then either moving to a new area or dealing with reinforcements one to three times. It's not all bad. Differing enemy composition keeps it from feeling stale, seven missions have what I considered interesting twists, and three or four do something that I found truly compelling. It's kind of hard to offer up ways this might have been done better, since there are only so many ways you can remix the flight action formula of kick ass and go fast. I do think interesting use of the environment is a missing piece of the puzzle. There's only a couple of missions where weather affects how you play, and environments are functionally flat with little terrain that affects gameplay. Well, at least there's no escort missions. Bosses mix things up and are impressively well presented and fair. Named enemies are introduced with an on-screen warning that shows their name and emblem before morphing into their health bar. It's a great way to show that they're bad news without a cutscene. In practice, they fly better and are tougher than normal enemies, but for the most part play by the rules. They cheat a little with things like Crimson Team having flares and the AOA module, but as far as I can tell there's no plot armor. If you can target them, you can damage them. It's a nice change of pace from invulnerable monologuing villains. Those get called out in another way, too. I won't elaborate on that, save to say it was one of my favorite parts of the game, and you'll know it when you see it. 
The boss fights are peak spectacle and a couple are highlights of the campaign. The best is hard to talk about without plot context, so spoiler time is now time. If you want to skip it, go to here. After reaching Cascadia, Sicario and Hitman team get to work rescuing Cascadian leadership and aiding the evacuation of Presidia before going on the offensive. It's on one of these ops that you run into Crimson Team. This is a really cool introduction. The music, your team's reactions, and the objective being to escape rather than fight combine to sell the idea that Crimson Team are not to be fucked with. That's something of a theme in Project Wingman. It earns itself a lot of credit for things that might not have worked otherwise by how they're presented and executed. In this case, it's that Crimson Team are cool enemies, but only show up three times and don't get fleshed out enough to serve as the rivals they're intended to be. I think only three talk, only Crimson One has a personality, and that seems to be Searchlight and PowerPoint enthusiast given his love of projecting. He's a pretentious monologuing villain who blames you for all his problems. At least he's got more going on than Frost, but we'll get to her in a hot minute. You get noticed by Senpai after either escaping from or fighting off Crimson, then continue the Cascadian Liberation Tour while he goes to rant about you in his flight diary. This culminates in Mission 11, the largest air battle in the campaign. This was the moment that I knew the game knew its stuff. Cold War is a huge spectacle, and while it doesn't throw any gameplay curveballs, the commitment to presentation and scale make it a blast. The gameplay loop is at its most basic, but the sheer number of enemies sells the fantasy of fighting a massive battle. It's followed by a solid boss fight. It's potentially your first time fighting Crimson Team, and they prove they're a cut above normal enemies. Regardless, you beat Crimson and solidifies Vendetta against you before going off to do something completely different. Where the first half of the game has been a cut and dried war story, the second introduces future tech, lays a foundation for more stories, and explores heavier themes. I've seen this game get compared to Spec Ops The Line, and I feel like that's a reach, but I understand how they got there. Hitman Team takes a break from kicking ass up and down Cascadia to investigate an offshore base. They wind up fighting an experimental craft piloted by Clara Rosk, aka Frost Druid, aka Frost, aka someone who isn't nearly important enough to be the one that quotes Pixie. You shoot her down, then head back to the war to do a Pearl Harbor and watch as fleeing feds set wildfires to aid a retreat. Ugh. After that, it's off to maybe the best mission in the game. Welcome to Mission 15. We've been waiting for you. This is a push on the city of Prospero in what looks to be one of the closing battles of the war. It doesn't go well. That might not be the sharpest twist ever written, but I found the scene remarkably affecting for how it's executed. The feds launch a barrage of cordium-tipped missiles, causing a chain reaction that devastates Prospero. You're tasked with stopping it, and you can't, but the vain attempt carries a sense of horror that's amplified by the visuals and music. Project Wingman hasn't been explicitly anti-war to this point, but there are implicit moments, and this is probably the strongest of them. Who could look at this scene, watch the end of the world unfold in front of them, and not be unsettled? Whoever they are, they're probably a Call of Duty player happy to tell you about the sick nuke they got the other day. It's the apocalypse now, and Hitman decides now is as good a time as ever to get the hell out of Dodge, but first, they're attacked by Frost, again, and Master Goose. You might be wondering who Master Goose is, and how I could have overlooked this character who is so critical to the plot. Never fear, dear viewer, because I'll tell you exactly who Master Goose is. He's a mercenary who talks in two missions and implies that he resents Sicario's success and will betray you. Then, resenting Sicario's success, he betrays you. You kick his ass and then kick Frost's ass, again, and find out that your friends aren't as dead as you thought. Before you can GTFO, your contact with the Rebels makes a deal to keep you from leaving. The deal is the one cutscene in the game and involves Stardust asking Hitman to hold the line while your boss recruits a mercenary army to free Cascadia. In return, you'll get something. It's never revealed what, with Comic only saying that it's worth it and Prez saying no one should have that power. I don't have time to fit a trip to the speculation zone into this video, so let's assume it's the fabled Eltnum Jav and move on. The next few missions build to the liberation of Presidia. You aid in eliminating the Federation's last holdouts, and in a climactic battle, Hitman Team defeats Crimson Team once and for all. The liberation of Presidia ends in a rebel victory and a ceasefire with the Federation that signals the end of the war. <laughs> God damn it. Crimson is back. This time, he has a Cordium Warhead and levels Presidia to get a shot at you one last time. King's is my favorite level, and it's chiefly due to how well presented it is. Duel at the End of the World is an underused finale, and the Crimson fight is suitably epic in its presentation. It's a very orange level, but it feels just right given the context, and is suitably thematic for a final battle. It's the same with the music. I think the tracks that accompany this level are the best in the score. This is one of those levels where watching footage makes me want to go play it again, and presentation is a big part of that. Mechanically, it's a little divisive, and I think I know why. As a one-on-one -on -one final battle against an enemy in a prototype jet, King's draws strong parallels to Zero from Ace Combat Zero. 
But where Pixie used a laser and missiles that aimed where he was facing, almost none of Crimson's attacks are based on facing. They're visually impressive, but between the missiles and death balls, I get the criticism that his fury isn't aimed at you. Gee, if only there was a genre of game where the player has to avoid large numbers of projectiles. The day one fight had issues with readability, but those have been fixed. Now I think the biggest issue people have with this boss is that it's not an ace combat boss, and it's not. It's a Project Wingman boss. It's a little jarring to have a boss with Macross missiles and death balls, but this is a game where railguns are commonplace. I'm willing to suspend my disbelief regarding the high-tech superplane. Narratively, a climactic duel against your rival is only as good as the rival. Crimson's the best we've got, even if his arc is losing to you and being mad about it. He does open strong, with maybe the most badass line in the game. Damn, that is a diss. Unfortunately, that's followed by a rant about how everything is your fault, using logic on par with people die if they are killed. His biggest misread is accusing a mercenary of not knowing why they're fighting. You're given agency to decide how personal things are for Monarch, but I knew why I was there. It's a challenging fight, but fun if you embrace it as more bullet hell than aerial duel, and I was glad to kill Crimson for real this time. Well, probably for real this time. The game ends on a particularly mercenary note. Everything sucks, but you won. Overall, I enjoyed this story. It's not perfect, but I was invested in seeing it through to the end. I think the only time I was taken out of the experience was when it got a little too into its inspirations. They've laid the groundwork for more stories in this world, and I'm interested in seeing them, so that's a win in my book. Okay, don't tell, but I'm gonna mess with the people who skipped the spoiler section. How was I supposed to know you had to do a no-hit run to see the beach episode? The party doesn't stop when you finish the campaign. Completing the game unlocks modifiers and mercenary difficulty. Modifiers remix the game in ways ranging from minor to drastic. The tamest makes your afterburner stuck on, and the far end is extreme. Like they say, everybody gangsta until the cruise missiles shoot back. Mercenary difficulty is closer to a new game plus. Same campaign, but things are a little different this time. I don't remember there being this many reinforcements. Or them flying SU-37s. Mercenary remixes enemy compositions and throws late-game enemies at you from the start. It's fun to see the ways each mission changes, but the downside of this approach is that late-game missions don't feel very different. These combine to give the game decent replay value, although exactly how much comes down to your tolerance for remixes. I enjoyed replaying the game on Mercenary, but modifiers aren't really my thing, and combining the two was right out. That just leaves Conquest. This was touted as a roguelike mode in the marketing, and that's a... liberal use of the term. You're challenged to fight your way across Cascadia with random objectives and resistance that slowly escalates to GPU-melting proportions. There are sort of roguelike elements, like buying planes with currency that's preserved across runs, but the only thing that's lost on death is your AI fleet, so calling it a roguelike is a stretch. It's a shame because I think the genre could make a really cool roguelike. Maybe you'd find improved weapons or planes or upgrade your loadout on a per-run basis. Conquest might not be that mode, but it's a perfectly solid score attack that focuses on the core loop. It's not going to make or break a purchase, but if all you have is 15 minutes and you want to blow stuff up, it's the mode for you. So that's Project Wingman. It's a triumph of indie design. It's not the best game I played this year, but it's definitely the best game I played that started as a one-man passion project. People will call it an ace combat clone, and that's sort of true, but I think that's doing it a disservice. It plays a lot alike, but tries new things, and I think it has the potential to become a rival to ace combat rather than being stuck in its shadow. This is an easy recommend for flight action fans, and I think I'd recommend this over Ace Combat 7 if you're new to the genre. If you like one, you'll probably like the other, so support an indie team and try the one that costs less and doesn't have 17 games of lore to unpack. As for me, well, I'm still excited to go back to Strange Reel, but now I'm also eagerly awaiting what's next for the world on fire. Thanks for watching.